heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we sit down with Marcelo Clare. He's launching a new venture firm focused on Latin America, aiming to raise half a billion dollars for its inaugural fund. Plus, more hurdles facing the Microsoft $69 billion takeover of Activision Blizzard. We'll discuss why a U.S. judge is temporarily blocking the deal. And Google hit with charges by the EU for abusing its ad tech dominance. We break down what's next for the process that could take years to resolve. But first, let's check in on these markets at the moment, Ed, because it is a day of macro consequences. It's a day when we wait for the Federal Reserve to come out. Will it pause? The market expects so. S&P 500 on a roll on its longest winning streak since November 2021, if we hold on to these gains. The Nasdaq 100 also on the higher side. Big tech on top. We're up by five-tenths of a percent. The U.S. two-year actually interestingly falling on the day as people really do think that the Federal Reserve is going to be forced to pause. That PPI data, that Focus on inflation actually showing some easing once again today. So people thinking good news is good news at the moment. And let's flick it on and look to the risk asset of choice when it comes to our world of technology. Bitcoin having a bit of a volatile day, but look, we're holding up to five tenths of percent gains. This as we start to see maybe some reprieve in the anxiety around Binance in particular and their particular token. We're seeing at the moment a weakening the US dollar versus Bitcoin. We're at twenty five thousand nine hundred and seventy six. What have you got in terms of the micro ed? Yeah, single names. In terms of movers to the upside, Tesla, we continue to track. It's kind of flirted between gains and losses. But if it is up at the close, it will be a 14th straight day of gains for Tesla. More than $240 billion of market cap has been added in that run. You get into the numbers, that $240 billion market cap gain is bigger than the standing market cap of 90% of the Nasdaq 100. We look at RSI, Relative Strength Index, and this is a stock that is very much in overbought ter territory, around 88, anything over 70 is overbought. Two kind of news movers out there as well. Uh, first of all, Alphabet, parent company of Google, moving to the downside just three-tenths of 1%, pairing some deeper losses. The EU has accused Google of abusing its dominant position in ad tech. We will bring you those details from Brussels later in the program. And NVIDIA, unstoppable, up 1.9% mm. and a fresh record for the name in AI. You think AI, you're buying NVIDIA because you think the GPUs are where it's at if you want to get skin in the game for LLM building. Tell you who else is unstoppable. Marcelo Claro, the former chief operating officer of SoftBank, got a new gig, executive chairman, managing partner of his own venture firm, Bicycle Capital. The firm has already amassed $440 million in commitments so far for its inaugural fund. And I'm so pleased to say that we're not only joined by Marcelo, but Shuniata, Bicycle's other managing partner, also of SoftBank, someone that we've spoken to previously on shows and Bloomberg events. Welcome, both of you racing to us. Marcelo, you're targeting $500 million. You've already amassed the $440 million. What would you selling to people? Why Latin America? What is there? So first, thanks for having us. Uh, I'll tell you that it feels so good to be an entrepreneur again and, and to have finalized my non-compete and be able to do what I love. And as I've shared with you in the past, my passion is in Latin America. It's a great place. It has size. It has great entrepreneurs. It's already created some amazing technology companies mm -hmm. that are world number one. And I think all it's lacking is capital. So, you know, we're lucky that this is our first day of a fund and we've only made a few phone calls and it's nice to launch with 440 million. We should reach our target of 500 million, which is what we're targeting to get it done. And we're proud to partner not only Shu as my partner in launching this fund, but also to partner with Mubarala who, as you know, Middle Eastern funds have become a deep place for capital today. And the fact that they are trusting Latin America in the growth side in technology to us is something that we're very proud of. I know we want to dig into that in a moment, but Shu, your experience, of course, you mentioned already you've shown that you can pick the right companies. Rappi, you did that over with SoftBank, both of you together with a Latin American fund there, as well as New Bank. What other types of technology are you excited about there? Because everyone's talking about AI. Is it AI or is it really across the gamut of what's being built? The interesting thing about times like now that are very uncertain is there's one thing you can count on is founders. Founders are focused on problems they can solve. 
And that's what makes them really interesting as an asset class in general in times that are as uncertain as this. And in Latin America, it's not really about the cutting edge. It's about inclusive technologies. It's about bringing technology to people who are deeply underserved, consumers and businesses. So it's propagating technologies deep into the pyramid. And that's a real greenfield opportunity across every market in Latin America. It's interesting, Ed. We were just hearing about the money that's behind this. And right. well, last time I spoke to Marcelo was out in Qatar. It was all about Middle East. And it's interesting where the money, the LP money, is coming from at this moment. Yeah, so Marcelo, my understanding is you're able to launch because your non-compete with SoftBank for Latin America has expired. So a comment on that. But Mubadala is interesting. Would you guys take money or, or bring in LPs from Saudi Arabia and China, for example? I think one is happy that now we can be back in business. It's a great feeling. And to me, happy that after you know, an exciting experience of being within the SoftBank ecosystem for many years, I can be back at how it all started in Latin America as an entrepreneur. So could not be more excited as that. As it relates to the initial fund, I mean, we, we, this is the start of a journey, and we intend to do a lot more in Latin America. This is our first fund, and we thought $500 million is a good way to start, and it's a combination of, uh, of uh, Mubarala, who to me is the premier sovereign fund in the Middle East, and my family office, and many other investors, including founders from Latin America, founders from the United States. So, so, so far, everybody that we've asked has come through in terms of you know, the potential amount of capital that we need. We really haven't discussed this with any other sovereign funds. And at this point in time, I don't think there will be a need because we pretty much have what we need for this first round. In the future, you know, we're going to look at where the business is, where the pockets of capital are in the case that we raise you know, bicycle capital two and three and four. But now we're focused on one. Yes. We got to go find the founders. We got to deploy capital. And more importantly, we got to make sure that we generate the returns as you know, when people are trusting you with their capital, it's something that we got to go generate returns. And Shu, good afternoon, good morning to you from San Francisco. Your friendship, your partnership with, with the guy next to you goes back to SoftBank. They were not uh, an LP or in, involved in, in the raising of this fund. But could you, through Bicycle, invest in any of the startups and names that you were both involved in during your time at SoftBank if they were to raise future funds? Yes, absolutely. Our, our core is to keep good relationships with the entire ecosystem. That includes SoftBank. We have a lot of gratitude to SoftBank. They help put the Latin American ecosystem on the map with our help, and they continue to be great partners. Marcelo, I call the master of momentum. He helps generate the drive to get things done, and then I helped execute it. And so we're just playing that role again here, but on our own this time. I like the momentum. I mean, the name bicycle in many ways. I know it comes from the idea of Steve Jobs thinking computer is a bicycle for the mind, but also you guys bike together. Uh, Marcelo, when you're building together, also you've had interesting partnerships. For example, Sheen, that's something that you're helping bringing a big company, a global company, almost the supply side to Latin America, helping the manufacturer in Brazil and Mexico. When you're thinking about the companies you're investing in, you're also thinking about global companies accessing Latin America. What what kind of big companies are you thinking of? How much of the fund would be dedicated to that? So this fund is all about Latin America, and it's about helping Latin American founders accelerate the momentum that they have, because there are great businesses in Latin America. But it's also about helping global companies who have a global momentum to basically land in Latin America. Latin America is close to 700 million people. People in Latin America make four times the amount of money that people make in India. The GDP of Latin America is two exercise of India. So Latin America is a great place if you understand that it. it's not an easy place to do business. It's complex, taxation and other things. So we plan to invest not only in Latin American founders, but also in companies that are going to go into Latin America. And there are so many companies that, you know, the current geopolitical landscape helps for companies that, you know, want to get into Latin America usually faster than they did before. So excited about bringing companies, bringing, you know, fintechs, bringing companies like Shein, who basically are disrupting the fashion industry. And there are so many disruptors, like I, I've always expressed, I think the next five years is going to be a world of disruption, not only because of AI, but because of technology. And it's going to change pretty much every industry, every vertical as we know it. And we want to make sure that if anything is being disrupted in Latin America, we have some role to play in that sense. You've been the disruptors before. Vision Fund upended VC in, in a way in, in many people's mindset. The size of checks you would write. Shu, if you're getting into really small companies but also really large ones and global companies, 
Can the checks be of any size? What are you thinking about where in the lifespan of companies you're going to be entering? It's important to say the ecosystem in LATAM is really good at the early stage. Yeah. They're great funds that have been working for decades to set the foundation. We do not intend to compete with them. So we come in at the Series B and later. Our checks range from 20 to $50 million in any given company. This is not going to be a big portfolio. This is about really choosing a few partners that we can work with for the long term. So we're talking about 10 to 15 companies in the life of the fund. So it's really about a close partnership. And we won't invest more than $50 million in any given company, but we want to have a real seat at the table. So if you want big ownership, you have to go early if you're writing checks of that size. Marcelo, Latin America is more than 650 million people. I get your history with it. But what inside Latin America? Where is the San Francisco or Silicon Valley of Latin America? Is there a Stanford equivalent churning out founders like we see where I am? I want to get some granular detail on where you see opportunities geographically and by which sectors. So a few things. There, there are so many Latin American founders who actually went to Stanford, who come to Harvard, who come to Wharton, and then they go back. And they, rather than become entrepreneurs in the United States, they basically take that knowledge and take it back to Latin America. And most of the stories that you've seen so far, a lot of those founders were US educated, most of them went to Stanford, and then they go back to Latin America with that entrepreneurial mindset. And that has given rise to a booming entrepreneurial ecosystem that's sitting in Sao Paulo, that's sitting in Mexico City, that's sitting in Bogota, in Colombia, because now there are huge stories of success. I mean, you have Rappi, you have iFood, to me, who's probably one of the best food delivery companies in the planet. You got Nubank, which is a Colombian who emigrated to Brazil, and today is the most valuable digital bank in the world, and the one that makes money, and the one that's worth tens of billions of dollars. You have, now you have the growth of Mercado Libre, who's a multi-billion dollar a marketplace that continues to grow. So today there's enough stories of success that have created entrepreneurial ecosystems that have shed employees who are starting a new company. So there's, the, I think what we started at SoftBank was, you know, we took Latin America from one and a half billion a year to close to $16 billion a year of investment along other funds. And that gave rise to a, a booming entrepreneurial ecosystem that right now needs our capital. And I think Latin America deserves a fund that is going to be focused only in Latin America and not the traditional tourist capital that comes in only when good times roll and then they retrench when things are not that good. We're there, we're committed, we're in it for the next few years. I made it a point to focus the rest of my career in Latin America and that's what I want to do. Shu, you are deeply dedicated not just to Latin American founders but diverse founders, minority founders with the SB Opportunity Fund. How much, when we are still seeing, look, an, an environment where interest rates are going higher, where companies are slimming down, where people are wanting to put money into tried and tested founders, how are you able to still focus on a minority founder? Do you? Is that priority? Well, the interesting thing about founders who are underrepresented is they have the grit it takes to succeed. They have been overlooked. They are the perfect solution for this moment in time. They do not come from the typical mold. They have had to struggle to get where they are. And we like to back those founders because we just think they're unfairly overlooked. So again, it's not about the macro for us. It's about the micro. And the people best suited to navigate moments like this are people in places that are overlooked, people who look like they're overlooked. And if you back those folks, we believe you can make a lot of money. We thank you for spending some time with us talking about the vision. Marcelo Clare, Juniata, they're running back for a plane. We thank them, Ed. All right, coming up, we're going to take a move from Latin America to Europe with the EU charging Google with abusing its ad tech dominance. That conversation coming up, not really weighing on shares, though, with flat on Alphabet, parent company of Google. I'm also watching shares of Vodafone out in the UK. The company and CK Hutchinson agreed to combine their UK mobile businesses in a deal that will create the biggest wireless company in that country if it passes muster with regulators. Vodafone Group PLC and CK Hutchinson Holdings Limited have agreed to combine them, but it's going to be a, a transaction where Vodafone owns 51% of this new company with an option to later buy out CK. Again, if it passes the test. London shares, six tenths of a percent. This is Bloomberg. conduct distorted competition among ad exchanges rather than letting the best of the ad exchanges win the race 
The helping hand of the powerful Google ecosystem gave Google's own exchange a unique head start over all other rivals in the industry. Annex could afford to keep its commission high without losing its advertisers. EU Commissioner Margaret Vestager there. Google being accused of abusing its dominance over advertising technology to crush competition. Now, that's as the European Union now fires off an antitrust charge sheet that threatens a breakup of the lucrative business. But look, it's a process that could take years to resolve. Let's dig into the details. Bloomberg's Mark Bergen is in London. Sam Stolton is in Brussels. And Mark, with the expertise of Google here, I immediately want to get their response. We've just heard from Margaret Vestager, and none of this seems to come as that much of a surprise to them, right? No, certainly both things, both having Vestager stand up and accuse them of, of monopoly, uh, of acting as a monopoly and dominance. And then this, this same accusation around ad tech. This is something that they actually had first in, in the U.S., uh, an, an identical case um, that they were using sort of both sides of the market in this pretty uh, opaque and pretty powerful uh, world of digital publishing. Um, so I think that's probably con a contribution why the stock basically didn't move. Investors have basically priced in this regulatory risk. Sam, just in layman's terms, what is the European Commission and the EU accusing Google of doing within the market yes. that it is well, so heavily involved in? Yes, yes. And hello here from Brussels. Well, effectively, the European Commission today has filed formal antitrust charges against Google's actions in the advertising technology space. And specifically, it's focusing on Google services that match supply and demand for advertising space online. And it's really all, all about self-preferencing. What the U European Commission says is that Google has effectively self-preferenced its own services to the detriment of other rivals in the market and this could obviously have distortive effects further afield in the online ecosystem and these are formal antitrust charges the investigation was first launched uh, by the European Commission in Brussels in April 2021 and it's very much as I say this first step in a procedure that could go on for a number of years Mark, explain what is Google's advertising technology business different from its broader ad offering? Yeah, it's hard to unpack in part because uh, it is that the you know, ad tech is so pervasive inside of Google. Like uh, when we think about and the commissioner talks about it, it is basically their machinery that um, deals with the buying and selling of online ads of, of everything that's sort of not Google's owned and operated property. So the things that aren't Google search aren't YouTube. Uh, are in its Play Store or Maps. Um, but at the same time, it's using that same exact machinery to make Google search ads, to make YouTube ads uh, much more powerful, much more effective, um, and to, I think, that its competitors would argue, sort of elbow out um, these com these services that are playing the digital publishing field but don't have the, the tremendous data resources of running the world's biggest search and video and mapping platforms. What's interesting here, Sam, is sort of how they're going for the jugular the EU here saying, look, remedies aren't enough to your business model. You need to start hiving parts of it off. But w it, will that become some sort of a reality? Because this is going to take a long time in the courts. Well, indeed. And I mean, it was one of the main messages today from the press conference with the EU's Commissioner for Competition, Margareta Vestager. And she effectively said that behavioural remedies were insufficient in correcting uh, the anti-competitive abuse here. And what's really fascinating is to watch the growing transatlantic sort of alliance around the option of structural remedies or like you say hiving off certain parts of the business in order to correct the anti-competitive abuses because as Mark just said um, there are of course a number of lawsuits open in the United States against Google's ad tech business and the Department of Justice um, at least in its lawsuit has has recommended the option of potentially structural separations and as I say one of the core messages from the press conference from uh, Vestager was today was that's very much an option for us too and we're now going to engage with those discussions with Google to see if we can make progress further afield in terms of correcting these problems. All right, Bloomberg's Mark Bergen out in London, Sam Stolton in Brussels for us. Thank you very much. Now coming up, more regulatory headwinds and hurdles facing Microsoft's $69 billion takeover of Activision Blizzard. We'll discuss why a US judge is temporarily blocking the deal. This is Bloomberg.
more regulatory action. Microsoft's $69 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard well, is temporarily blocked by a federal judge in California who said a temporary restraining order was necessary to maintain the status quo while the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, challenges the deal. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton. And is this just part of normal process? Is this a surprise or are we expecting it? Well, it's a really interesting development because you see how the FTC is trying to make sure this deal doesn't become a foregone conclusion. And part of the context of this is that we have kind of competing decisions from the other side of the Atlantic, where the UK competition authorities have said that this deal should not go forward, that it would be bad for market concentration. Whereas in the U EU, antitrust authorities have said this deal can go through with remedies and it's actually good for competition. So you definitely see the Federal Trade Commission trying to make sure that this doesn't go forward, that this deal doesn't uh, play out while they're trying to prosecute their case here. I know it's a temporary halt because the FTC filed that emergency motion Monday to halt the merger. There will be a hearing next week here in SF, an evidentiary hearing for a longer term discussion around halting it. What, what is Microsoft and Activision's response to this about having to go in, before a judge? Well, we saw, we heard from Microsoft President Brad Smith yesterday where he said, you know, he's looking forward to presenting Microsoft's case in court. And one of the differences is that this is a federal court where the Federal Trade Commission has to go and ask for this hold, whereas the actual case, the actual complaint filed by the Federal Trade Commission is in their in-house court. So there's a slightly different uh, juridical situation for them. And Microsoft has said that they look forward to presenting their case in federal court and kind of mm. see that as, this is an opportunity to defend a deal that they say would be good for competition. And briefly, Anna, this is a global narrative, right? Absolutely, yeah. Like I said, you know, we see kind of competing decisions from the other side of the Atlantic. And also, you know, Microsoft positioning itself very uh, strongly there, you know, criticizing the UK for their decision to block the deal and praising the EU for, for letting this deal go forward. Right, Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton out in DC. Thank you. Right, coming up, Caroline, we're going to talk with the CEO of the digital consultancy firm, Publicis Sapient, about the impact of, guess what, AI on growth and how it can accelerate an economic recovery. That's next from San Francisco and from New York. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. And I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's check in on these markets. It is Fed Day. We're waiting for the all-important decision. We are looking at actually the markets sustaining their higher inclination. NASDAQ up four-tenths of a percent. Big tech managing to rally as many feel that there's a pause that's likely to happen in terms of interest rates, of course, that being helpful for some of the technology focus and future cash flows. We're looking at the two-year yield actually dropping some four basis points as people start to price in where indeed the Fed will go. At what point we'll start to see the rate hiking process be in an end, most factoring in September now. We're looking at Bitcoin just up about five tenths percent as well. So look, it's relatively wait and see mode overall, but we're seeing some of the anxiety, particularly around Binance exchange there, dialing back a little bit in crypto sphere. Let's move it on and look at some of the individual movers because while well, we're getting Microsoft on the upside more than a percentage point higher, maybe because of course, there's a forced stoppage on their plan to be purchasing Activision Blizzard, $69 billion being dropped. So maybe that's on the rally side or maybe it's more of an AI theme that's happening with Microsoft today. Nikola, one of Ed's favorites and fo focusing in on some 16% higher, actually have been leading some of the charge in the other EV space. But largely, Nikola, having of late been push to pause any future supply side issuance of further shares. But on the upside today, as we see maybe uh, more of an interest rate focus going on, I'm looking at AMD as well. This is AI front and center. This is a company, of course, that's unveiling its AI focused chips, processes that are going to be AI accelerated, being able to support generative AI and the processing of data there that much faster. The market seemed to like what they were hearing from that particular CEO. Ed? All right, Caroline, bear with me. I'm going to do something now and, and combine two of our favorite topics, AI and inflation, or rather, AI and deflation. How are those two things linked? Well, let's bring in Publicis Sapient CEO Nigel Vaz. Your job is to work with technologists at all kinds of firms, banks, quick-serve restaurants, to digitally transform. You tell us 
how AI is deflationary? Our, our belief right now is that when you think about the ability for businesses to serve customers in lower cost, more efficient ways, AI is a huge accelerant to what they're trying to do, which means they achieve growth with lower costs and efficiency and productivity. Pretty much every Western economy today is suffering from population challenges, people dropping out of the workforce. The, the hospitality sector in particular has been particularly hurt. So lots of check-in lines, orders heard incorrectly. AI is helping with the work we're doing to start to make these simple, basic consumer experiences easier, more effective, and frankly, uh, more efficient for these businesses. So, so to us, I feel like that is a real opportunity uh, to drive some of that growth at a, at a lower cost. Where do you sit in, in the debate around whether AI will eliminate jobs versus sort of be supportive of existing roles? Well, you know, there's uh, uh, some research by uh, David Artur talking about the fact that since 1940, uh, we've now seen, you know, 60 to 80 percent of jobs not exist uh, today. And a lot of those jobs have been created by technologies that have come over the course of that period. When we think about AI, of course, there are going to be some jobs that are impacted. And governments and public-private partnerships, the kind of work we do to bring in new skills and capabilities from younger people entering the workforce into this technology is going to need to happen to continue to build skills. But we also think this is going to be a huge opportunity for growth. We recently acquired fully Publicis Sapien AI Labs, a joint venture we created a few years ago because we feel like that's going to help us bring in more people into the workforce into this new space. What if about, you think about GDP, you know, Goldman Sachs is talking about 7%. The National Bureau of Economic Research is talking about 14% uh, in terms of impact on worker productivity. I think all of these things will create opportunities. Yeah, Nigel, you just mentioned how you're training well, the future workforce. What about the future? For, what about the workforce of the here and the now? Do the C-suite, do the people below them, have the skill set to be adopting all the joys and risks of generative AI in the here and now? I don't think anybody was expecting the adoption of this technology to happen as quickly as it has, right? But what it does tell you, the fact that you have so many people engaging with this, making this one of the fastest adopted technologies, is the potential is certainly there. With that come risks, management of ethics, understanding bias, all of the issues that have to be worked through. But our belief is certainly now a lot of the existential threat that's being talked about AI. We're not in a place right now where that is in the immediate future. I think there are bigger issues in the immediate future in the context of AI. Like how do you ensure that bias and things that brands wouldn't want associated with them uh, you know, how hallucinations, all of these ideas getting addressed today. And, and companies are making investments very, very quickly because the benefits on the other side are huge. You know, we're seeing molecule uh, identification yeah. in pharmaceuticals. We're seeing fraud detection in banking. We're seeing risk management and uh, risk assessments for mortgages. All of these things now starting to be able to happen so much more seamlessly than was possible before. Nigel, I'm kind of fascinated just the intricacies of exactly what you go and do. You set up a meeting with a company who's new to you. What do you go in and say? How do you start to assess the need of each individual company, where they're currently at, because ML and AI is already in our life, and then what they need to do to start to ensure that they're getting all the benefits of productivity? You know, Publicis Avian is fundamentally in the business of digital business transformation, right? Effectively, very simply, what that means is helping businesses that were established transform themselves to be increasingly digital in a world that is fast becoming entirely digital. So our approach centers around this notion of this idea called speed. It is an acronym and an idea about helping businesses move quickly. And one of the biggest challenges with enterprise businesses is the CEO would ask for a strategy in a business case, and then that would turn into requirements. And then they'd linearly pass that baton onto the next rung and the next rung. So for us, the S in speed is strategy. So being really clear about what use case you're trying to drive the outcome from, assessing that, and then moving very quickly to this idea of P, which is product. So not thinking about the business in the context of a project that begins and ends, but a product that is constantly evolving. The E is experience. So how do you think about the experience of the employee and the experience of the customer, the patient, the citizen that you're trying to affect? The next E is engineering. 
which is all about how do you build these experiences in ways that allow you to evolve ever so quickly. And then the D is data and AI. So how do you create that closed loop system, almost like fingers yes. on a hand, where the data feeds back into helping you automate and, and build the efficiency we're talking about. And that conversation today uh, in many organizations is about, yeah, we've got this and this and this, but they don't work like fingers in a hand. You know, there's a strong thumb and a strong index finger, but they don't connect to the pinky. And guess what? It becomes very hard to lift and shift and move things yes. in that context. Uh Nigel, for what it's worth, a headline crossing the Bloomberg terminal from BlackRock CEO Larry Fink, who's speaking at BlackRock's Investor Day, he says AI may be the tech that brings down inflation. When Nigel Vaz goes into a company like that, be it Walmart, JP Morgan, Marriott, do you want the CEO sitting on the other side of the table from you to implement this change with AI? Or do you want the CTO? Who's leading the charge within these companies? I think this is a business change. And of course, you need a very strong CTO, CDO, somebody who understands how the technology works. But for us, AI is an opportunity to reimagine the business. So, you know, the, the Bloomberg, uh, you know, um, terminal headline that you were just calling out there, our belief is that doesn't happen when it's a CMO or a CIO or a CDO. This has got to be something that is a CEO priority. And from all of the CEOs I'm spending time with from some of the biggest companies in the world, I can tell you this is the one technology that they themselves have started to realize will force the choice for them to be more transformative rather than digitizing what they already do, which is, has been the first wave of digital, I think, thus far. Publicis Sapient CEO, Nigel Vaz, great to have some time with you. Larry Fink and you on the same page. Meanwhile, coming up, no, we're going to be talking about the Swedish tech scene. We are so global today. Standout tech companies that are currently being built in that market. Bob Thomas is joining us, partner at Ox. This is Bloomberg. Time for talking tech. First up, a new study is shining light on who may be the biggest winners and losers in the global AI boom. Research from McKinsey says generative AI could add up to $4.4 trillion annually to the world's economy. However, AI tools will likely put more pressure on the labor force and could especially be a disruption to higher wage knowledge workers who, whose work would be threatened by automation. How often are we discussing that? Plus, Advanced Micro Devices, or AMD, is hoping its new line of AI processors can compete with the likes of NVIDIA in the AI computing market. During a, pre during a presentation Tuesday, the company showcased the MI300X Accelerator. It will speed up processing for generative AI services and aims to help data centers streamline a crunch of AI traffic. And speaking of NVIDIA, the company drawing is drawing made some hefty stock buybacks last year after a three-year hiatus. The chip maker repurchased more than $10 billion in stock ahead of a massive rally fueled by Wall Street's AI frenzy. Now the company is drawing attention because it stopped buying have it been, despite having more than $7 billion on its buyback authorization. An NVIDIA spokesperson declined to comment. Caro. Let's go broader let's go to Europe for a moment because at the moment brilliant minds 2023 is upon us look it's the foundation and related event established by Spotify founder CEO Daniel Ek and it's focusing this year on a theme of future gazing the slew of speakers ranging from tech startups actors activists education sustainability leaders and much more they've also got a program to highlight startups in the European scene brilliant innovators and one of the men behind that is Ox partner Bob Thomas, who's joining us for more on the event and indeed the innovator that you singled out as the winner this year. Let's start, Bob, with Brilliant Minds as an event first and foremost. What is hoped to be achieved? This is about shining a light on Sweden, on the ecosystem, but also well, Swedish principles in many ways. Yeah, absolutely. So Daniel initially set up the Brilliant Minds Foundation with uh, with his board, which consists of some influential Swedish families to uh, bring Swedish values to creatives, builders, innovators from across the world. So every uh, every June, kind of mid-June, 
uh, actors, activists, you know, some of the people who you've highlighted already descend on Stockholm uh, during one of the most beautiful periods of the year and enjoy a two-day uh, conference where they discuss kind of creative ideas and, and the vision for the future of, of how the world might look uh, in, in a positive sense. So, you know, in, in Brilliant Innovators, what we're trying to do is extend that to the startup ecosystem and say, you know, how can Swedish ideals of sustainability, of inclusivity, uh, you know, how can we highlight European startups that are promoting these ideals? And you've singled out as a winner this year a French startup that is all about sustainability, particularly in aircraft, right? You're shining a light on one particular company. It's all about hydrogen propulsion. What got you there for this particular set of founders and, and business that they're trying to build? It was a combination both of the vision, which is to, so let me take a step back. So the business is beyond aero. Uh, it's a, as you say, French uh, business focused on hydrogen fuel cell transport in the private aviation space. Uh, and that business has a massive opportunity uh, to take an enormous amount of carbon out of air travel and, and essentially kind of, jet, you know, one of the biggest polluters uh, in terms of kind of carbon emissions uh, in in the European landscape uh, to take a huge amount of carbon out of that. It was a combination of that proposition, that vision, and then the quality of, of the pitch and of the team, you know, huge number of industry experts aligning around, around a shared cause. And, and again, to, you know, to speak to those uh, ideals of, of teamwork, of, uh, you know, having, having a kind of collective long-term principle in mind when you develop a product, uh, it, it really spoke to the judges. Was there any commonality, Bob, between the founders and the startups that entered the competition? Were they heavily AI focused, for example? Uh, interesting. So I've, I've been uh, watching your tech show for some time, and, and obviously, kind of in recent days, oh, thank weeks, you. the focus has been very, very much on on AI. Um, actually, relatively little mention of AI in the startups that we looked at, which was strange. Um, there was a skew towards uh, material science. You know how to how to innovate in manufacturing, innovate in heavy industry, um, you, w with the thinking that you know a big part of the reason that startups were entering uh, was part of a sustainability theme, part of a, a long termism uh, around the environment and around other kind of cultural issues related to pollution. Um, so actually, AI, you know, d d despite the despite the focus of things kind of more generally within tech and, and within my space in, in B2B software uh, in the last few weeks, uh, AI was uh, absent. Bob, earlier in the show, we had Marcelo Claure on about his new venture firm, Bicycle. I'm sure you're familiar with Marcelo, and, and he's all about Latin America. Let's talk a little bit about Sweden with you. You know, I'm here in San Francisco. The history of this place in Silicon Valley is that you have Stanford. A lot of people focused on computing and software they found companies, the VCs all moved here. Is there an equivalent thing going on out in Sweden and Nordic nations right now? Yes, absolutely. And, and I would say to some extent it's already happened. Uh, so the European uh, Investment Fund and, and EIS have highlighted in their annual report that they do kind of ranking European geographies on, on the basis of various innovation metrics. You know, Sweden's been the top country in, in Europe for a number of years, and that's driven by, you know, quality of education, but also that first cohort of great Swedish startups has now gone beyond the point where they've, you know, a lot of the founders have exited, they've become public businesses, and you have those initial set of founders reinvesting in the next cohort of startups. So, you know, to take Brilliant Minds as an example, it's a foundation set up by Daniel Ek. And, you know, the support for that foundation is driven by the fantastic success that he's achieved with Spotify. So, you know, Spotify, Klarna, Izettle, you know, these great Swedish technology institutions now are feeding back into that early stage ecosystem. And, and also, I mean, there's a, a great kind of private capital ecosystem that's developed here over, you know, over the course of really 20 years, uh, which we're very happy to, to play a small part in. You know, what's interesting, Caroline, every day on Venture Spotlight, we have VCs from around the world. And if they're American, we pose the question, are you looking outside of the US in terms of where uh, you're writing checks and looking for opportunity. Mm. And uh, what caught my eye actually on LinkedIn today was Niklas Zenstrom, of course, another key Swedish founder, founded Skype, gone on to have Atomico, a, a very successful VC in the space. He's put out a thought leadership piece today, Bob, all about why Europe's going to be the next area of innovation, why checks should be re being written there. But look, Ed and I have both been based in Europe. We've both talked about technology there. And it was always this wringing of hands that there's never quite been 
the moment that they powered through, that they were able to put their stamp on it. Do you think this is different? Do you think ultimately that we shouldn't always be that one area or region will win out vis-a-vis -vis another, all can do well, and, and will eventually American money come in a more significant way to Europe? Yeah, I, I think we've definitely seen, particularly in a kind of low interest rate environment, particularly during COVID in, in the B2B software space, we've seen a huge amount of American money come come to Europe. And, you know, I will say to some extent we're seeing seeing it leave again now, given given the economy and given the pricing of technology businesses. Um, but, but I think the development of European ecosystems, you know, initially in places like London and Berlin, but now you know, in the Nordics, you know, not just Stockholm, but Copenhagen, Helsinki, you know, we're seeing a great startup ecosystem develop in the Baltics, you know, particularly in Estonia and Tallinn, but more broadly than that. You know, I, I think it's really driven actually not by the influx of American money, but by the recycling of capital uh, from cohorts of, of great technology businesses, you know, to take Stop. We've given a, a Swedish example, but to take Estonia as an example, you know, Pipedrive, great B2B software business, sells globally, is now a global business. But a lot of that capital gets recycled into into yeah. the, the Estonian ecosystem and becomes fuel for the next generation of seed stage Estonian startups. What's interesting, of course, we were looking at some pictures of the company that's just won overall beyond Aero, and it was a lot of guy engineers in the pictures, and we're sat here with. Uh, a white male VC, of course, but Brilliant Minds in and of itself is very diverse, female CEO, and also thinking about the people that they brought together in Sweden. How diverse is the European talent pool right now? How diverse are the founders that you're coming and seeing pitched to you? So, so I would say, the CEO, firstly, the CEO of Beyond Aero, uh, Eloa, is a woman. Uh, right. And unfortunately, she wasn't pictured in, in the video, <laughs> but, you know, just to can be clear about that. Um, I, you know, I think Sweden particularly does rank very highly, uh, particularly in terms of gender diversity in companies, uh, at a point where you know, we're almost at kind of gender parity in terms of in terms of public company CEOs in Sweden. And um, I think that you know Sweden has been a an early mover uh, in in the right direction. I, I think there is you know fundamentally in Europe, but also particularly within tech, still a long way to go. Uh, in terms of diversity, and and I think it's important that we're yeah you know, we're doing more on that. Brilliant Minds is is leading the way, uh, but yeah you know, I think we as a fund also lead the way, I and mean, we we care very deeply about the diversity of our team uh, and the diversity of the companies we invest in. Ox partner Bob Thomas out in Sweden. Thank you so much. When you write your next big check, come back on the program. Yeah. We'll talk more about the Nordics in Europe. Thank you for your time. This Fantastic. is Bloomberg. Time now for what's going viral. Fans of the Beatles, you're in for a treat. So Paul McCartney says that we can expect to hear one final song from the British pop group. And he's crediting, guess what, artificial intelligence for the help. In an interview with the BBC Radio 4, McCartney said that the song was made using a demo with John Lennon's voice and will be released later this year. And Ed, what's interesting, I was lucky enough to be at Glastonbury this time last year. Paul McCartney right. was performing. And at that time, he performed alongside virtually right. John Lennon and that was using an isolated Lennon vocal at that time so already they were using so, machine learning it's called AI to do demixing so this was a demo tape that Lennon did on a cassette before he died in 1980 he gave it to Yoko Ono Yoko Ono gave it to McCartney and all the AI does is isolate the voice and so in interviews McCartney's talked about how it's so exciting because tracks that they never quite finished and now can finish are available but he's also admitted it's kind of scary if you think about it. Give infinite life to something that wasn't quite quite done at the time. And there is it them working with the artists, right? A lot of the other anxiety has been around copyright issues, it's been around yeah. deep fakes and, and really how the business and industry navigates that. AI just keeps on giving us new areas to contemplate and we love it that it's in music at least. Wow, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Yeah. Big, big show. So much to recap. So don't forget about the podcast. Spotify, iHeart. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>